coronavirus uh, cases surge across the UK, so does the misinformation from COVID deniers and anti-vaxxers. This was the scene outside St Thomas's Hospital in London on New Year's Eve. Remember, this is where the Prime Minister himself was treated for COVID early last year. But protesters were shouting, COVID is a hoax. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, said on this programme he would support emergency legislation to tackle anti-vax misinformation online. Spain, meanwhile, is setting up a register to track those who refuse to take the vaccine. So should those who spread anti-vax misinformation be prosecuted? Joining us now to discuss this is Professor Robert Winston, due to receive his vaccination today and believes we should focus on educating anti-vaxxers. Broadcaster and Childline founder Dame Esther Ranson has already had her vaccine and says those who spread misinformation should be prosecuted. And Noreen Khan, a community leader who's spreading the pro-vaccine message in Bradford, where anti-vax beliefs are strong. So, uh, Stella panel, morning to all of you. Um, Professor Winston, so you're having your vaccine Station today. First of all, how do you feel about having the jab? Well, I'm very pleased because, of course, it's a protection against uh, a serious infection, which is killing a lot of people. And the second point is what we do about people propagating uh, anti-vaccination stuff, particularly online. Uh, I mentioned one earlier who's a reality TV star with a million followers on Twitter saying she thinks the whole thing is just uh, massively exaggerated, shouldn't have the vaccine and so on. What do we do with people that have that well, kind whole, of influence? There are a whole range of things you can do, of course, which don't involve prosecution. I'm not sure that prosecution using the law in this kind of way would be helpful. And certainly prosecuting people who refuse to have a vaccination would be unethical because, of course... And actually dangerous, too, because, of course, there's always a risk that somebody might get an adverse effect, uh, result, and that would be ca catastrophic publicity for what is a very important uh, vaccine. All, all of us in the, in the country are vaccinated for all sorts of diseases all the time, and all those people standing outside St. Thomas's have been vaccinated for measles, they've been vaccinated also, of course, for smallpox and a number of other very serious killer diseases. And I think what we need to be much more aware of is better information and better education. Unfortunately, what they really are showing is a massive mistrust of government. And that's because the government has consistently produced messages rather than actually having a proper conversation with the public. What if you have somebody who's got a big following, uh, who may be a high-profile journalist or something, who is posting deliberately false information about, say, vaccination uh, for coronavirus, should there be, as Keir Starmer was suggesting, legislation specifically to deal with people who have a large uh, <laughs> influence who are deliberately posting false information? It's a, it, the, 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 the prosecution must be against the people who publish the information, which is not the same necessarily as the people who post it. And I think the, there's a need to be much better control of social media. Unfortunately, we now live in the day of the message, which is sort of three words rather than proper information and proper explanation. And this actually essentially is a failure of our society now to debate. We don't debate any longer. We listen to messages. And that really, and so we induce anger, we induce all sorts of adverse, um, adverse responses. I'm, I'm pretty sure that I, if I went round and talked to some of those people in that crowd out St Thomas's, outside St Thomas's, they would get the vaccine afterwards. Yes, I'm absolutely they... sure that they need proper medical information. Noreen Khan, what is the problem in your community where, um, you know, you're going to have to persuade people, exactly like Professor Winston says, that it is essential to get the vaccine. Why are people anti-vax there? Uh, absolutely. Good morning, Susanna. Um, so, yeah, the, the anti-vax, I, I think we've got to start to understand where it's stemming from. And a lot of this is, is stemming from frustrations. Uh, and, and a lot of these communities, if you're going to refer to BAME communities or disadvantaged communities, it's it's citing from it's just this rhetoric of, of being anti-vax. It's, it's merely that the neglect of public health and government and communities who have been pushed aside. It's ultimately social, socio-economic inequality that has created this mindset. I am pro-vax. Um, I cannot wait till myself and my family um, get the call for the vaccine. But those who um, are currently anti-vax, it's a belief system. And that has stemmed from mixed messages, just like Professor was saying just now. Um, and I think these mixed messages are causing multiple um, confusions. And then the misconceptions and the myths are deriving from this. And we have to get to the source of where this information is coming. It's certainly not the celebrities 
who are just reposting or retweeting. Where is this coming from in the first place? And we are seeing it daily. There are different messages coming from leadership at the moment. There is no um, a, a I synergy between any, public health and government. I don't think there's any divergence in messaging from leadership over the vaccine, though. Uh, th there is a, the confusion on the ground, Susanna, with all due respect, is that what, you know, like, for example, the first vaccine, the Pfizer, and it was supposed to be um, the, the second dose. And now that that goalpost has changed. Once you start to change goalposts at that level, when you're starting to get um, people's mindsets coming round to the idea and you change it again, they're going to say, whoa, red flag alert here. Um, and then this is what's happening consistently. Education is the key. Our COVID lead program that we've uh, created is to target exactly exactly those anti-vaxxers through education. We've got young people from Bradford who are predominantly uh, clinical uh, sciences and pharmaceutical students who are upskilling themselves with intelligence using um, professional medical professionals from the local area who are then going to go out and have those COVID conversations with communities who are currently okay. anti-vax. And we're never going to change everyone's mindset, Piers. Um, you know, it's no, no, a belief I agree, system, I agree, I agree with that. going to believe. I agree with that. And I think there are multiple strands to this debate. Mm. But Dame Esther, I think that my particular problem, and I think it's one that Keir Starmer touched on, is I don't want to prosecute people who don't want to have a vaccination. We're not that kind of country. Uh, however, I can see the really damaging influence of high-profile people propagating completely false information about the safety of these vaccinations and being believed and retweeted and so on. And there may be a case for those people in that particular instance that there should be some form of regulatory uh, interference with them to stop them doing this, because the platforms, sadly, like Twitter, Facebook and so on, we know are too lax at this at the moment, and it will cost lives. Yes, I'd better come clean with you, Piers. I do you, use you as a bit of a confessional, as you know. And I discovered yesterday that my great-grandfather was a pioneer anti-vaxxer. Really? Mm. I was talking to my sister about him because he also was an anti-germer. He didn't believe in germs. And uh, she said, well, he was a, he was a great anti-vaxxer, you know, and he tried to stop people in New York getting the smallpox vaccination. So I've got that off my chest. Uh, great grandfather, you were wrong. Would I want you to be prosecuted? Well, here's the thing. When I broke the law, you see, it is a confessional for me. <laughs> and I drove at 39 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour um, district. I was told that I could escape being fined and having points on my license if I went on a speed awareness course. Mm -hmm. And it was really good. I had to watch a video which explained the real danger of even going five miles mm -hmm. over the speed limit. And it convinced me and it changed my behavior. Now, the difficulty is the science is complicated. You do have to understand why we've eradicated smallpox, how we've done wonderful work to eradicate polio, which was a plague that affected children in my youth. People really need to understand it. And it's not just a conversation. Um, I couldn't be a, a greater admirer of Lord Winston if I tried, but I think if he went out on the pavement and started to talk to those young people who were somehow convinced in their heads that it was all a government conspiracy, I think the fumes in their brains would not be dissipated by logic. I do think you have to I don't see anybody on I don't see anyone on Twitter ever change their mind about this kind of thing. I, if, I, if anything, I see them get more and more entrenched because they're living in echo chambers. They only follow the people that basically endorse what they're what they're believing.